Okay, uh, can you hear me? All right, so um, I'd like to make uh, um, some discussion about the midterm uh, before we continue on our uh, subject of inheritance. So today we're going to talk about multiple inheritance. Um, which lead to our homework assignment number five. Um, so I already, uh, some of you might already saw my announcement. I already, uh, um, hold on one second, where's my, I was actually trying to use a uh, chat GPT to, to, to solve the midterm myself this afternoon, okay? So um, I, I actually have a folder. Oh, wait a minute. Why this is not coming up? That's why you didn't see any. Okay. Huh. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so I already announced uh, the midterm. So let me just 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 talk about some logistics. So we're going to do midterm on May nineteenth, which is next Friday. So give us more time for you to uh, develop this. the The exam, the question, and what should be the answer format is already included in the PowerPoint. I might make minor update. The minor update not about the question, but more about some. Um, clarification or some of the term, it might not be 100% uh, clear. So essentially what you can do is you can discuss with other students or you can work on yourself. You can use chat GPT. I mean, whatever you want to do, that's fine. And, and the thing is from that result, you can actually print out a copy of a whatever you think. It should be the answer because I give you the PowerPoint. You can actually print it out and bring that hard copy to the classroom for that 50 minutes. And you actually handwrite because I'm going to print the hard copy, the blank copy to every single one of us. And you, you, you're going to basically handwrite write it down to that exam. Okay. So that, that's just logistics that, that what, what will happen. So because we only have 50 minutes, I really encourage and also I want to say that if you actually provide uh, unnecessary more detail is actually uh, going to be harmful for your grade. Just let you know. Put down the most important information. Okay, let me just give you an example. Uh, how many of you already seen the exam? I just released about an hour. Some of you have seen that. Basically I said, well, how do you actually use design object system to help as a community to be able to track down some of the potential serial killer prospect. And, and the thing is that um, in that case, that how do you actually do that in a way that you won't sacrifice our privacy and be able to use the, the things you're working on record in uh, homework assignment three and homework assignment four. Let me just tell you when I enter just part of this exam, into uh, chat GPT, this is what they told me, okay? So if you look at the first part, I basically say that's, that's your exam. If you read it, you know that that's actually from the exam. I said, well, how do you develop a, a mobile app called Continuous Periodically Record Information, right? And then this is what chat GPT gave me. He said, the development of the app, you need to do the following step. Define the requirement, define the user interface, increment app, and blah, blah, blah. A lot of them, most of this basically are not needed. Okay, if you, if you look at the exam, most of this are not needed because, of course, I know I need to have a requirement. Of course, I know that I need to do the user interface. And the thing is, the user interface is actually in the pseudo code. Object oriented itself is an interface. And, and the thing is that, so, so basically just tell you that, um, you said, well, define the data that needs to be recorded. That's 
probably closer to what we we want it, until I reach like a point number four. Okay, so just to let you know that is, I really want to test you on two things. About two thirds of the grade will face on whether you apply the object-oriented principle correctly. Object-oriented principle means abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Whether you apply, and you don't need to apply all four of them if you don't feel needed. And, and the thing is, however, if you apply and you did it wrong, your point will be deducted. I mean, I, the, the example I gave in the exam is multiple inheritance. Um, you probably know I have a, I have a personal bias against uh, multiple inheritance, which I will explain why to you uh, in my today's lecture. Um, I always challenge saying that if this problem can be solved using single inheritance, I will avoid using multiple inheritance. And, and therefore, for example, if you decide to use multiple inheritance, you need to justify why multiple inheritance is necessary. I mean, just, just the, whether you apply, whether your understanding about those basic principles is, is correct. Okay, that's what we want you to do. Okay, um, so, so here is a final exam. Okay, sorry, in case you haven't seen it, this is a document. I talk about what the question and how I'm going to grade it, what's required, and also the, the some of the simple code. For example, um, if you look at one of the document on GitHub, where's my GitHub? Here. So in GitHub, I have actually three files right now. And I said I will keep updating this if, if there is. But I want to tell you that the, the core of the exam, the question you need to answer is already static. It's just a minor clarification. Okay, I mean, I, I just thought about this. Uh, for example, in the, in, the, um, in the exam itself, I actually say, oh, as an example, because essentially what I want you to do is you, you take, take your homework assignment number three as a record, and now I want to derive or extend it using whatever inheritance to another record, which for me, record information. The example I said is a sound recording. It's a sound recording. It means that I will somewhat continuously or periodically, when I go to a new position, I'm actually going to record what sound that's available. So this actually helps us to actually say, oh, if that area, there is a, somebody actually has a sound that's similar to another place, which the, the murderer or, or whatever the, the, um, the homicide was occurred, they have that sound so they can actually correlate and discover the information. That's just an example. So I, I use sound instead of using video for two reasons. And number one, the, the video I feel is too, um, uh, how, how do I say that? It's kind of intrusive. For the for the privacy concern, um, so and then the second thing I feel, video is not good if, if I'm thinking about the the phone. If I want to record the video, I probably have to pull out the phone and then start to scan it. I, I I'm not turning on to scan you guys now. Okay, don't worry. But I I might have to do this. So I thought I I didn't use that as a as an example, but. Then I thought about that when I when I released the, the example. I said, well, if I actually wear some kind of like a Google Glass, if I wear a Google Glass, and it is, it's like I'm just walking and I'm recording the, the things around me, but I can actually do some kind of privacy enhancement is that I can develop some algorithm, which you don't need to actually develop the detailed algorithm. You just mention high level that this capability is available. You said that this algorithm will only record the color of the clothes, just like that. Not facial recognition, not uh, not uh, 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 any kind of uh, uh, whether it's a is a is a figure or whatever profiling, but just record the color of the people or the animal, uh, assuming it's a pet that you have seen around that. So, so I'm just using this as an example. This is actually the extra record that you can have and which 
collectively, it might actually be useful. So the, the midterm exam, there are two parts. One is, okay, what is the information you need to decide whatever that class, either is a sound record or whatever record you want to provide. And which, what information need to be there? So that, that is a design, that's an object-oriented design that you need to provide. And then the second thing is that, well, what is the protocol for the, for the data to be collected? So which means I give you an example, for example, uh, the Davis uh, local police uh, send out a panic release alert that you know that this is actually from the police department asking for, we have an incident in this location. And in that case, you actually pull out your phone, you press a button, and the thing is that it will find all the record that's actually related to that particular position around maybe plus and minus six hours or something like that. And then in, in my example, I have a, another uh, attribute called partner. Means that when I was there, what's your name? Paulos. Paulos. Okay, Paulos was also there. Your phone is there, my phone is there, and we kind of know each other or we actually have some protocol. So we actually sign in each other as a partner. So I actually say I was there, and this time with whatever sound I recorded and my partner has Paulos and what's your name? Jonah. Jonah and then a bunch of other people, okay? So, so this, I might actually need to send a message to them, but they're just high level describe. I need to get their consent. And then we actually release the information. I mean, let me actually tell you that why this partner is, is might be interesting is that if I want to find out at this location, we heard something, but then we actually went on three different directions in a park. And 10 minutes after that, they might actually hear something quite different. And then if the killer is actually go this route for uh, Jonas, and maybe Jonas will have more information about that. So that's kind of the scenario about how information might be able to uh, be collected and more interesting to actually help us uh, to enhance our safety by quickly identify uh, what's going on or which area is unsafe or where is uh, the potential footprint of the serial killer. Okay, so, so that, that's kind of the high level about, uh, so, so I want to emphasize, I do not expect you to write a lot of stuff. I want you to actually do more of a thinking process. And, and I want you to uh, think about a solution using what you learn from this class and my help, the safety of our community. Okay, so that's, that's let, let me actually give you an example. So last year for the midterm of uh, fall 2022, as I released the simple midterm to the class uh, a few weeks or a few days, I forgot when I released that. That was actually asking about a, a, uh, a dilemma about when you have an autonomous car, uh, which which motorcycle you're going to hit if you don't have a choice, whether you hit to the left or hit to the right. By the way, that was a, one of the ethical principle in autonomous drive about how can a autonomous engine make a decision that's actually uh, we think is 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 the best. And obviously, there is no good decision. For example, most of, most of the students they, they they still get very good score. Most of the students saying that I collect your health record, I collect your, your, uh, your uh, how do I say that, your age, because I want to hit the uh, older person instead of a younger person. Okay, I mean, you got a sense about that, but it's very tricky, okay? So, so basically all the people say they will hit the older person, whatever, whatever role that he's younger than me, I fail him, okay? That's why they're probably still here. No, I'm just kidding, okay. So, so they basically collect all this information and try to do that. But the most innovative student, he actually makes this and the, the, the answer I like the most is the following answer. He said, actually it's she, uh, wonderful student. Um, so she said, I want to design the motorcycle and the autonomous drive in a protocol. So whenever this car is going to make a decision about I'm going to shift left, because it's going to make an impact. 
what her decision is that there was a protocol such that the motorcycle knows she has been chosen, then she actually will move it to attach to the car. So they actually move together. So I feel that's very innovative because she is not thinking about, she's out of the box, not thinking about, oh, who I should sacrifice. But instead, she's thinking about how do I be able to redefine the interface about the, pro, about the uh, motorcycle and the car and such that under that situation, it more, almost like a two robot arm connect together and they move together. So I feel that is innovative. So I want you to think out of the box in this situation, uh, because I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really a tragic event happened in Davis. Um, but I think if we can actually learn something from this event and we can actually think about it as a student, um, how we might be able to help to solve this problem. I think that will be very valuable for our education. Okay, so I want to tell you that that is that is uh, the kind of the, the the flavor of of this exam, and and final exam might be similar to this one as well. Okay, um, so I want to tell you one thing is that since I released this exam, um, I will. I will answer all the questions about the exam, like a clarification, like a, what is the principle of object-oriented, but I won't be able to answer a question such as, is this idea innovative? Okay, I had the one student asking me a question saying, in the class or private, doesn't matter. He said, is this idea you consider innovative? Innovative is very subjective, by the way. Um, so, my answer to them is that at the moment you ask that idea to me, that idea is no longer innovative, okay? So that, that, that was my answer. So I, I want you to really, really, uh, but, but if you want some boundary or you want some guidance, I can actually uh, give you some, some idea, clarify, but I really want to, for that 5%, there was 15%. 10% is kind of mundane. It's based on how you use the object and the principle to represent the idea. But the other 5% is really looking at the context of the problem to see if you can have some merit and uh, um, innovation. Okay, so um, okay, so just, just tell you that the exam, I think I have, I even described what's my policy about uh, chat GPT is open book, open laptop, open internet, and uh, open chat GPT, whatever, uh, of course, before and during the exam as well, okay? But exam, during the exam, there was, you only got 15 minutes, and there was uh, things you need to write down. So you, you don't have a lot of time, so you need to do your preparation before that. Well, I actually want to say what's considered uh, um, cheating. I feel... You can discuss with people with regarding the idea, but when you start forming your own design, and that should create some difference between what you're thinking and other people's. You might be similar at some level, that's okay. So let me tell you that one of the things is definitely cheating, is that six of you talk together, you actually come up with an answer, and you actually print a hard copy and you make a six copy. Each of you actually grab one copy. And then you actually write down exactly the same answer during the real exam. When I read it, I say, how? Oh, wow, the six is essentially syntactically, lexically identical. Then that's actually considered cheating. Okay. So you must provide your own words and then you print it out and then bring to the exam. Is that is that is that okay? Does that sound reasonable? Okay. Any question before I start talking about multiple? Yes, please. Okay. In in my opinion, you, you might not have time to collaborate in the exam because it's 15 minutes and you have to write a substantial amount of information. I mean, I can tell you that almost all the students submit in the last five minutes. They keep writing, but I do want to also emphasize, I feel some of the students uh, wrote too much, wrote too much um, irrelevant detail. So think about this is uh, elevation, what do you call it? elevator talk. I, I don't know if you heard about that elevator speech or elevator talk. You try to make the most important thing. 
you're welcome to talk to anybody before the exam. Uh, during the exam, I don't want to suddenly two students uh, sit down. So no, no communication um, during that 15 minutes. Yes, in the back. Okay, so communication chart is represent how objects are going to communicate with each other. Okay, so for example, I have an object. This is a, a say a, a person object, and then this object is a uh, law enforcement. So law enforcement send call a message to the the person saying that hey, I need I I actually issue an uh, alert, and this student will send back. That's a communication. It's it's just a communication chart is representing a member function call amount a set of object, essentially. So, so let me actually tell you that what is the difference between pseudocode and the communication chart. So pseudocode is almost like this kind. This is pseudocode, by the way. You can think about that. This is the pseudocode. Okay, so by the way, in the exam, if you have a syntax error, you miss a semicolon, that's fine. Okay, I don't, I, I actually, don't like to pick uh, pick on say somebody make a small minor mistake because the compiler can help me to correct that easily. Okay, so I don't think that is the most important learning objective. So this is this is a, a shoe code. If you take a look at the shoe code, it doesn't have any implementation detail. It doesn't have any implementation detail. It just has the method. But then how do I actually know the implementation detail or how this method got called in what scenario? I actually want to have objects. I mean, let me actually use this as an example. Okay, let me actually say this one is the Felix. Okay, this one is is Davis Police Department. Okay, assuming I have a two object, I can describe it looks like this. And then I can say, where's my, uh, here, it must be here, yeah. And this is the Mesa, come over here, okay? And then I will just add, this is a MESA call. This is a member function call. Let me see where is, no, I want to A. This MESA is called uh, alert. Alert maybe have a time and maybe has some kind of location. So you don't have to do it exactly syntactically, but just convey the idea. Okay, so this basically say, hey, I got an alert. Felix object got an alert, uh, which from the police department regarding some time and some location, and maybe with uh, some simple description. And then I, I might actually need to, assuming, assuming this is, I have another one. Jonas, what's your name? J-O-N-A-H. J-O-N-A-H, like this? All right, thank you, Jonah. And then I might be sending another message. Let's see, where is my message here? I send a message, say uh, consent. I would just say consent. Text. Consent request. Okay, I'm going to neglect some whatever parameter I'm going to put in there. And then, of course, you can draw more line, which represents how the information flow, how the data is collected, and how do you actually be able to uh, collect information flow. So does that answer your question uh, in the back about communication chart? Okay, yeah. Yeah. It's learning. Um... When you say alert, are you saying is that a method of the Davis Police Department or is it a method of Felix? It's a method of uh, Felix. It's a method probably going to be in the SP person, right? right? Because it must be the, the, the person who actually got called. 
Uh, that's why I call the SP person. Yeah. Then why is it? How is it going from the Davis Police Department? Like, oh, uh, so essentially in this case, uh, is you you can actually if 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 I understand your cor correctly, you can actually just say Felix dot alert, right? Does that help you a little bit? And how do, uh, um, what signify? Why is the arrow starting at the Davis Police Department? Mm -hmm. How is that part represented? Oh, okay, okay, I I see. Because that is the object, that is the, that is the uh, message call. The caller was the Davis Department, Police Department, and the receiver is is actually uh, Felix. I mean, I mean, I, I, let me give you an example. Um, how do I actually explain this uh, easily? So if I actually, uh, I try to find a good example from what we already have. Okay, okay, I, I know what 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 to do. For example, um, I'm a person that age. Okay, I'm a person that age. Felix is a person, and under person that age, I have GPS, right? GPS, my current location. So when I do my uh, dump to JSON, I need to pull out my. Uh, the the record about my uh, GPS location, then essentially I'm actually going to call the Mesa to actually obtain the data from the GPS. So GPS is an object, right? And then person is also an object. So that arrow should be the person sent it to GPS object. Is it, so here, would it just be that Davis Police Department has a method to send an alert to everyone? And you can make an assumption. Yeah. And the implementation of that method would be to send alerts to every individual person. Right, 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 right. So so in this scenario, we only, oh, by the way, that's a good point. Uh, what's your name again? Nithin. Nithin uh, mentioned something interesting. So in this scenario, you can see that you don't have to represent all 70,000 citizens in Davis or whatever city. But in, instead, you should just using one or two example to illustrate your idea, that will be fine. Okay. All right. Any other question? Yeah. Do you think the alert function should remember the function of the Davis position and this function should be the object, which is the person? You can do that. You can do that as well. But but I I uh you can do that, but I I, I just wonder why uh well, my 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 issue is that then you need to worry about who actually will call that alert. So if you have an alert function in Davis Police Department, assuming you have a class to represent Davis uh, Police Department, then there will be another object is going to call that message, right? So then you need to you need to model something else because who is going to issue that? Uh, who is going to send that alert to the to the um, to the um, police department? In this scenario, I'm assuming that it's already been done. We trust Davis Police Department, and they already did a lot of uh, investigation, and they actually send out whenever they actually realize there 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 was a homicide. At this time, next minute, they can actually decide. I want to send this alert to collect more information. So if you want something else to send to the Davis Police Department, then logistically, who will be that person? Who actually have a authority to do that? That's that's complicated problem, I think, in my opinion. Okay, so what I, what I mean is, is still the Davis Department send out the alert to the person. I just wonder why we can't make this function as a random function inside the Davis um, Police Department. And you just take an extra argument. No, the the... No. Why? Why is a mem Why is why is the alert is a, it, it is a a Davis Police Department's member function? Why is that? Why do you want? Because alert is a function that's actually alert me. I'm the receiver as a person. That why there is alert to the Davis Department. There must be a reason to do that. The only reason I can think of is I want to alert the Davis Police Department. So that's fine. 
you want to alert the Davis Police Department. Did, did I did I misunderstand you? Yeah, that's not what I mean. I, I okay. Mean, I mean, the department send all the interviews to this. Right. Yeah, and the, the function is inside the department, but just to the extra uh, parking which is a person, so it can send the alert to that person. Uh, yeah, you can you can do that. That's that's fine. It might complicate things though. Oh. But but you can do that. Yeah, you have a question? I saw a hand. Oh, I did have another question. Sure. Uh, so earlier you mentioned we like I think we describe in English like at a high level what a class the function of a class. Mm -hmm. Um, do we do that in the like what slide or what part of the test should we do that? Should we do it in the class hierarchy area, like where we put where we actually put down the classes? When you put down the classes, you have a class hierarchy to represent any kind of inheritance relationship or or some of the I call the singleton class. Okay, it means that it's not inheriting at all. And you 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 describe what classes you want for each of the class. You actually want to write down a pseudo code, a, a simple pseudo code. That's actually the pseudo code looks like this, right? The pseudo code looks like this. It's basically defining a class. Looks like the it's it's like a when you, a pseudo code really define that particular class. What's the interface to that class? What information? Yeah. Okay, so we're not actually like writing any English. We're just writing pseudo code, the class hierarchy, and then the right. communication chart. That's it. Right. right. But you do. But in some sense, there 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 are some uh, information which is you might not be able to easily represent. As as a communication chart, you can actually put note saying that doing this. I mean, let me give you an example. Um, for example, I'm actually doing some. Uh, I have a lot of record about sound. So when I actually receive the, the alert from the from the police department, I actually internally I actually want to say, well, I want to filter that what record might match that description and that part. I might not want to represent the communication chart. Otherwise, my communication chart could be really, really complicated. So that's why I want you to actually try to simplify the communication chart to represent the most important information. That's it. Okay. All right. So you have some freedom to decide what level of detail you want to represent. But my uh, experience is that don't go down too deep. So um, it, it, when you draw a communication chart, uh, if you have at most four objects that they are communicating, that should be uh, the, the limit. Because anything go beyond four objects, you represent one communication chart, is actually pretty hard to understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do they have to use both communication charts, or is it just... Um... Okay, mm -hmm. I, I actually provide, I print out multiple copy of this in the final exam. So you decide how, how many you want to use. I just print it as a format for you to use, but you don't have to use all of them. Okay. Okay. Um, just save your question until uh, pretty much every single class until next Friday. You can actually ask me question or offer sound. That's fine. Okay. So now I'm going to switch back to uh, multiple inheritance. <clears throat> okay, there's one thing I want to explain a little bit. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time uh, talk about this chart um, about implement these two function. One of them, dump to JSON, you already done it in homework three, and JSON to object, that's actually essentially um, uh, a homework uh, four subject that you can implement. So I just want to uh, tell you is that if you, if you have this, um, there's some reason that you can, you can actually do that. Um, this is kind of like advanced object-oriented programming subject. Um, if you want to implement something we call persistent objects, so what is a persistent object I mentioned? 
is that an object was, was uh, you kill the program, the object will still be there. So the idea about persistent object is you actually do a dump to JSON. So it's a JSON format and you're saving the file. And then when you actually want to uh, resume your program or you want to start your server, you basically just, just basically read the JSON from the file and then you call uh, JSON to object, then you actually got your object back. So that is a one kind of things you can use with this two function. Um, but the other topic, which I want to say that you probably heard about, I used uh, the GitHub folder I said, mobility. Why is it mobility? This was actually designed initially, try to implement the concept of mobile objects. So what is a mobile object? Mobile object is that I have an object on this machine, but at some point I realized I really don't want this object to be on my machine. I want to move this object to somewhere else. So I can actually let the object interact with um, whatever want to interact with the object at a different location. So this is called object mobility. And with object mobility, it's actually really can be easily accomplished if you use this idea. So uh, what, you, what, you, what you did is you actually convert your object into dump to JSON. So now you have a JSON screen and then you use uh, RPC, JSON RPC, and then send it to another server. And then in another server, they are actually doing object to, sorry, JSON to object. Then you essentially revive your, your, your object there. So you can do this in real time scale. So you can do this. Um, so just to let you know, I'm actually asking, uh, uh, I would just include this part, let you know. I, so I asked this question uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, um, in chat GPT, I said, well, if I want to move a C++ object, how, how should I do it? And I got the answer, which included in the PowerPoint. I'm not going to talk about the detail. If you have a time, you should take a look at that. It's very interesting. Okay. All right. So I'm actually going to switch to multiple inheritance. I have eight minutes. I'm going to do a really, really good, uh, quick introduction, and then I will go for the detail. So I'm going to show you a piece of code. Okay, take a look at this piece of code. Um, this piece of code has four classes. Has a four classes, and the base class is called account. And then I have a two child classes called uh, employee. Employee actually uh, inherit from the um, account, and also have a student also. Uh, from the account. But then I have uh, a, a, a another class called work study. And the work study is actually inheriting from both employee and the student. So this is a syntax of multiple inheritance. So work study is a one uh, class that's actually inheriting both employee and the uh, student. Okay. Okay, this is multiple inheritance. This is its syntax. So I want to actually ask you a question here. I have a two possibility to interpret that statement. The key question get down to whether a object of work study has one copy of account or two copy of account. So let me explain to you. This one is basically say uh, the work study is inherited from employee and student, but it only have a one instance of account option. But the diagram on the top basically say, I'm actually doing inheriting, but I have a two account object. One account object I was inheriting from student and the other one I'm actually um, um, inheriting from employee. So so first let me ask you uh, what do you think I, I should be doing here? Should we have a one account or two account in this scenario? You said two? You think two? Uh, all of you th think about it should be two? Okay, if, if I have, I mean, obviously it's application dependent, right? If, if I have uh, like a, a one account is dealing with 
how I pay my tuition and the other account is how I get paid as a salary. So I have a two account. But if this is the Kerberos account, if it's an email account, then I should only have one account, right? So whether I should have a one account or two account, depending on what type of multiple inheritance you'll be using. So now I'm just telling you that um, be aware, multiple inheritance sometimes when you go beyond your parents, means your grandparent, whether you have one copy of your grandparent or two copy of your grandparent, because this will only occur when you have multiple inheritance, that is a decision you need to make. And then that sometimes complicates things, okay, unexpectedly. So let me actually tell you that this is called multiple inheritance. So in C++, when you have multiple inheritance, it means you have two copy or even more than two copy of your grandparents. So whenever I inherit from the account, uh, from employee and student, I'm actually have a two account. If I have a three, I actually have a three account. And then if the in multiple inheritance tree keep growing, I'm actually going to have a more copy of this. Okay, so uh, in homework five, you will learn, well, how do you actually access to different copy, right? This, whenever I actually try to do it here, then I, I need to know that which account, because now I have a two account, I need to address that. Okay, so this is called multiple inheritance, but then another way, how do I do the button? If I do the button, this is called virtual inheritance. So C++ have this terminology called multiple inheritance versus virtual inheritance. If you add a keyword when employee, uh, see the virtual keyword is here. You see that over here, employee account, that's it. Student account, that's it. But in the, in the virtual inheritance, you need to add the virtual in front of an account. That means if any child class inheriting multiple of this kind of account, then this become result using virtual relationship. That means only one of them will be needed. So, so that's why this one is called virtual inheritance. You only have a one account, okay? Any question? So I just tell you syntactically, there are two notions of multiple inheritance. One is called multiple inheritance, which you have a multiple of the grand group grandparent, but then you can actually consolidate them using virtual inheritance, okay? Um, so the next topic we're going to say is that, okay, so now you have a multiple inheritance then I need to worry about um, the, the biggest difference between C or C++ programmer and uh, other programmer like a Python or, or Java programmer is that C programmer need to worry about what we call memory layout. So memory layout, if you, I talk about a little bit of memory layout in the pointer uh, lecture, uh, I released the link, I hope you, you watch it. So you understand a little bit about how a, a operating system have a layout and how a pointer or memory allocation was done over there. If you really have a trouble understand that lecture, let me know. I might have to highlight a few things or be happy to help you with that. Okay, so for multiple inheritance and virtual inheritance, the, the most difficult uh, things we need to worry is not just about how to use them because you need to know what kind of inheritance, inheritance you're defining to decide how to access to which variable, but also you need to worry about the where they are in the memory layout, especially related to the testing. Um, if you are pointer sensitive, this become very important. So um, it turned out that virtual inheritance, let me actually first tell you the memory layout of multiple inheritance. So multiple inheritance, the layout looks like this. You have a chunk of memory represent work study. You have a chunk of memory worry about a student. You have a chunk of memory worry about the student's version of account. And then you have a, a chunk of memory worry about employee. You have a chunk of memory worry about the employee version of account. So you actually have the memory layout looks like this one after, after another, it kind of, compact together, that is 
the memory location for you to actually host your object, okay? So that, that's actually multiple inheritance. But in virtual inheritance, things are getting tricky. You see, I have a two gray area. Because I only have a one account, if you compare over here, the account is on top of work study in your memory layout. But in virtual inheritance, the account is actually below the work study. That's a very big difference. And why in some case I put it on top, why I put it here. And then instead I have a two virtual uh, V table, virtual table pointer for me to actually put it here. And, and essentially the V table pointer help you indirectly pointing over here using pointer. So essentially for you to understand virtual inheritance, you need to understand a little bit about how pointer really works. Okay, yeah. So um, both of the, the V table pointers, both, both of those sections, they, um, they both address the same attributes in the Yes, and the other thing, I'm just starting to give you a like a like a, a teaser in this topic. The other topic is that this cannot be decided at the compiler time. So this one you can see that is a compiler time. When you use virtual inheritance, runtime and runtime have to do that. That's that's why I actually make it really really complicated. Uh, there is a runtime issue there for C program. C program. Okay, all right. So I will see you on Wednesday. All right. Sure. So I know that like we're supposed, or do we create like a function to print out 